Amen, amen. Well, good morning. Why don't you have a seat? It's good to see you. If, you're not, if we've not met before, my name is Bubba. I'm one of the pastors, and it is my joy to spend some time with you in uh, the Word of God today. Uh, we're doing this three-week mini-series called Spiritual Gifts. This is actually week number three, so this is our final week of this series. Next week, we'll jump back into the uh, Gospel of John and pick up that, that study that we've been doing for a while. Um, and uh, really kind of the, the heart of this three-week series is for us together to learn what are the spiritual gifts, what are the gifts that each of us have, as well, how do we use those gifts together as a church community and um, build each other up and even see the mission move forward. And uh, we are indeed kind of in that trajectory, headed in that direction as a church. And so I'm glad you're with me today and we're able to spend some time together talking about this some more. I'm going to pray for us. And then we'll jump into it together. We're going to be uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you want to just grab your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter 4, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, Let's pray. God, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for loving us and taking care of us and uh, just just being with us. Uh, You are all that we need. And we are so thankful for you, God. As well, we thank you for uh, giving spiritual gifts, that you would give us these, these abilities to partner with you in life, in mission. Uh, we do ask and pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, speak to us today, help us to understand uh, not just the, the, the truth, but how the truth applies in our lives and how it applies individually and corporately as a community as well. Uh, we do pray, God, uh, help us to learn how to function and operate as a gifted church body, uh, how to function and operate together so that we can uh, minister to one another, so that we can build each other up, so that we can flourish in life, so that we can make an impact uh, in our community. Uh, We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, uh, I I was thinking about uh, a movie recently, and I don't know if you guys, anybody movie buffs? Anyone like movies? Some of you. Um, and I was, I was thinking about an, kind of an old movie, like from the 90s. Have you ever, did you ever see that old movie, movie called uh, Rudy? Do you know the movie I'm talking about, some of you? You're like, yeah, I love that movie, yeah. Sean Austin, ah, yeah. Or, um, so if you don't know the movie, I'll kind of explain what the movie is about. It's actually based on a true story, which uh, the movies that are decent movies, or are actually good movies that are based on true stories, are... I, I tend to like them even more. And this was a movie about a guy named Rudy, and he uh, wanted to uh, be on, uh, he wanted to go to Notre Dame, and he wanted to be on the football team for Notre Dame. That was like his dream in life. That's what he wanted. Uh, and so that was like everything to him. The only problem was is that Rudy was short and not very athletic, and uh, <laughs> And also, like, he didn't have good grades, and so he couldn't even get into the school when he tried to apply. He had to work really hard for years and kind of go through, you know, kind of work his way up through, like, you know, community college and all that, and then eventually transfer over. And then when he did get, he finally did get uh, uh, accepted to Notre Dame, and he, he applied for the football team and tried out, and he wasn't really that good, uh, but he made the practice, practice squad, right, because they always need people to beat up on the practice squad. Uh, and, and so he was on the practice squad, but then what happened is he was really passionate, like more passionate than anyone else. He was really committed, more committed than anyone else. And he worked really, really hard, harder than anyone else. And he started to kind of inspire everyone, you know, cause he was like this hard working, dedicated inspiration. Uh, and he was just trying and trying and just, he was always going for it. Um, but again, he wasn't really that good. So he wasn't good enough to make the official team. By his senior year, they let him come on to the, the you know, to the, the official team on the last game, right? So we're thinking senior year, last game of the year, they let him actually put on a jersey and sit on the bench during the game, right? And so think about this. His whole dream is, I want to be on the football team of Notre Dame. He's got the jersey. He's on the bench. But here's the thing. In order to be an official player, you have to play at least one play. So it's not enough to have a jersey. It's not enough to sit on the bench. You got to get actually in the game. And then 
uh, Notre Dame was like dominating that game. And it was the last, like kind of like the last two, three minutes of the game. Everyone's like, coach, you gotta let Rudy in, come on. Like we're, we're, we're winning. Like he's not gonna screw it up, you know? Uh, and they, the coach actually did let this guy on the field. So he got on the field to play and it's like the last play of the game, of the, the last game of the season, his last year of school. And it's this play where then they go and he's, he was playing uh, defense. And so they do the, you know, he goes for it and, and Rudy goes through and he sacks the quarterback, right? And the whole, the whole just like stadium just <laughs> erupts in celebration. Because you have to understand, like everybody at school knew this guy and they knew his story and they knew how for years he'd been trying to get on the team. And then now he made it on the team. He actually made a play and then he actually sacks the quarterback. Wow, you know, they picked him up and they carried him off the field and everyone's celebrating and cheering. That's only happened twice in the history of Notre Dame. Someone being picked up and carried off the field and it happened to Rudy. And, uh, and, 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 we, and we look at that story like that, right? Because we see those stories and we're like, we love those stories, right? The underdog makes good. Anybody like the underdog make good, makes a good story? Of course, right? Because we are the underdog, right? That's why we like those stories. Because we're like, yeah, I'm not that tall and I'm not that talented and I'm not, you know, and I want to be on that team and I want to I wanna do that. Uh, and so we love those stories when we see someone accomplish something like that. It's inspirational. It's inspirational. And I was thinking about the differences between uh, the ways of the world and then the ways of God. Because the ways of the world are you have to work really hard to try to prove yourself. And then once you prove your worth, then you'll be accepted. And then maybe you get on the team. But we're going to bench you for a while. We might give you a jersey, but you're not officially on the team unless you're able to make a play. And we might let you make a play, but only if we think you won't mess it all up. All right, the ways of the world. But the ways of God are so radically different because the ways are God, of God are like, yeah, maybe you're not that tall and maybe you're not that talented, but guess what? It doesn't matter because God left heaven and came to earth and lived among us as one of us and lived without sin and died for our sin and rose from the grave and conquered sin and death. And so now God has made it to where we can all receive salvation and not only salvation, but we can experience the, you know, the, the spirit of God indwelling us. And then God gives these spiritual gifts so that though we aren't that talented, we now have spiritual gifts, supernatural spiritual gifts. And he like gives us not just a jersey, but he like puts us on the team and he doesn't put us on the bench, but he actually says like, hey, you're in the game, right? Because Jesus is like, look, y'all, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm ascending into heaven and you now got to go and make disciples. And so this whole mission, this whole change the world thing, that's yours now. So the ways of God are so radically different because the, way of, the ways of God is like, you are on the team. You are on the field. You have a, a play that's happening right now. And I was just thinking about that and thinking, like, our God is so cool. He is so cool. So how, how, do, how does this work out, right? You're on Team Jesus, but how do we function as Team Jesus? What does that look like? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So we're jumping into Ephesians chapter 4, starting uh, with verses uh, 4 and uh, kind of like 4 through 6. It says, um, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So here, what, what we see happening is, is Paul here is talking to us about the, 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 the unity that exists within God and how that unity is the unity that we have as the body of Christ, the church. And, and, and I want you to consider this for a moment because this is really important for you to get the way Team Jesus works, okay? Because if you don't understand, if you don't understand the unity of the Trinity, it won't make sense the way that unity plays out on Team Jesus. Because our unity as a community is not just modeled after, it is possible because of the unity that exists between, between uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
the way that there is unity within the, 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 the Godhead or the Trinity, perfect relationship, perfect community, perfect unity, the Father, Son, and Spirit perfectly in sync, working together. That kind of unity is the unity that we have because we are in Christ and as we are in Christ, Christ is in us. And as Christ is in us, we experience the unity that he experiences with the Father and the Spirit through him, but also he enables us to have that same kind of unity among ourselves. Right, so, so it's not just that we're a team of a bunch of individuals that have their own thoughts, lives, and desires, and we just kind of do our own thing, but rather we're brought together as Team Jesus with a special, supernatural unity that literally is a unity of the, of, of, of the Trinity that we've been given. And when you understand that, you start to get what it actually means to be Team Jesus. So look what he says here. One body, one spirit, one hope, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What is this? We're one, we're one, we're one, we're one, we're one, we're one. Unity, 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 unity. We're one. Right? We looked at a couple of weeks ago when we did the first week of this series, we looked at how the, 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 the church is called a body, the body of Christ and how we're one body, but there are many members or many parts of the body. And though the, the, the members or parts aren't all the same, uh, they're all important and needed and necessary. And, uh, and that's the way that God has designed, designed the church. Now we're gonna look at the same idea and we're just gonna put a little slightly different angle on it and say, we're a team. We're team Jesus. We're one. We're unified. There's unity. But it, that does not mean that there's uniformity, right? We're, we're, we're not a bunch of like, you know, like robots. <laughs> we're people, we're individuals with unique personalities and talents and gifts and thoughts and passions and all these kinds of things. And God has, has, has intentionally designed it that way. Okay, now we're one, we're unified, there's unity, but there's not uniformity. How does it start to play out? We keep going in these verses. Look at verse seven. He says, uh, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. There's just a few things I wanna point out here. First, it says, but grace was given, right? So grace is unmerited favor. It's God's blessing, though we don't deserve it. He's saying God has given us blessing. He's blessed you. He, 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 he's chosen you, and what he's chosen is this kind of gift, right? The measure of Christ's gift. What is the gift? I think here he's talking about the gift of salvation, how God has chosen us to be saved in, uh, in Christ and to have salvation in Christ. But then it goes even beyond that because he says he doesn't just give salvation. There's more that's happening. He's giving, he's giving other things here. He says... Uh, as he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. This is kind of like the imagery of someone who's a general who goes out and wins a war. And then when he comes back to the city, everyone's celebrating because he's like led the captives free and everyone's like, yeah, and he's coming through town and there's this big celebration. And then they're like giving gifts to all the people to celebrate what's happened. He's using that kind of language, right? He's, saying, he's like saying, look, Jesus has accomplished salvation through his work on the cross and what he is doing is he's giving gifts. He's giving the gift of salvation, but there's other gifts that he's giving too. He says here, he gave gifts to men. And I think this is referring to the spiritual gifts that God gives. He gives the spirit. The spirit gives us spiritual gifts. The spirit empowers us for spiritual work. Uh, and we've got these spiritual gifts and there's this, this, this partnering with God that's happening on team Jesus. But, but it's, it's not just the giving of salvation and the giving of gifts. There's even more in the giving. Because if you keep going in verse 11, he says, and he gave uh, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So again, what do we see? We see he gave. Who's the he? The he here is Jesus. 
And he gives, what does he give? He gives, well, apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and, and teachers. What is, what is he giving? He's giving a team. Do you get that? It's a team. But it's, it's a specific type of team. Here he's saying he gave a leadership team. So now we start to see more texture, more nuance to the way that the, 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 the church, the body operates and works. Right? God is head. Right? Christ is head of the body. We are the body, the members of Christ. And as the head of the church, Jesus builds the church and he does it in a very orderly way. He has intentionality in the way he goes about it. He gives leaders to the church and the leaders have specific roles and responsibilities that they are to, to, to fulfill for the good of the church. And he also gives gifts to the church and the church is to fulfill their roles and responsibilities as well. But right here, what Paul is saying is he's saying, Jesus gave leaders and their gift to the church. Think about that for a moment, okay? Think about this. Godly leadership is a gift to the church. Right? Among us, there are, there are leaders, people who lead in various ways, right? Life group leaders, student leaders, kid leaders, uh, women's ministry leaders, men's ministry leaders, uh, people who are leading in a number of different uh, businesses, organizations, nonprofits, people leading in a whole host of different ways. And if you're a leader, you're a gift. You're a gift. You are a blessing. You're a blessing to the people that God has put you in leadership over. The, your, your, your job as a leader is to bless the people under your care, to be an extension of God's grace and God's goodness to them, right? That's it. But you are a gift. And I think that's beautiful personally, that God would intentionally give leaders to be a blessing so that people could be blessed, but then also we could even acknowledge and celebrate the gift of leadership and the gift of those who are leaders and appreciate the, the ones who are leaders. I think what Paul is doing here is, is he's saying, look, I want you to understand the, the, the leadership that's happening so that you can appreciate what God is doing on Team Jesus, right? He's established this team. He's established these leaders and it's important for us to appreciate this. Now, in, in saying this, I want you to think about the team for a moment, okay? Because what do we see? Is this one leader? No, it's a bunch of leaders. So there's a plurality. So it's a team of leaders. Does every leader have the same spiritual gift? No. And different leaders have different gifts. Right, we see here like five different types of leaders, five different types of gifting. And so Jesus gives leadership, a leadership team, but it is a, it's a plurality of a, of a bunch of different leaders with a bunch of different gifts. This is important to understand because, look, no one leader has all gifts, right? Only Jesus had all the spiritual gifts and only Jesus perfectly exercised all the spiritual gifts. Everyone else uh, may have one or multiple spiritual gifts, but they don't have all the gifts and they don't perfectly exercise the gifts. And leaders are not perfect. And what this means is that you know, leaders have strengths and weaknesses and there are some things that they don't know and they don't know how to do and they're missing. And so what God does is he says, look, it's, the church isn't to have just one leader and, 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 and one gift, but rather a plurality of leaders with a bunch of different gifts. Why? So they can complement each other. Why? So that where one is weak, another can be strong and vice versa so that there can be a complementary gifting that happens among the leadership so that the church can be cared for well, so that the church can flourish. 
Because if you think about it, if, if, a, if a leadership team isn't well-rounded and doesn't have the different types of gifts on it, then it's missing something. And if it's missing something, then that means that's an area where the church is probably not going to be able to grow and develop as God wants it to because there's a missing, there's a missing leader, there's a missing gift. And so God's design is a multiple of leaders with a multitude of gifts so that the church can be built up and equipped in a multitude of ways. And, and when you start to understand that, it will help you have an appreciation for teams within the context of Team Jesus. Because it's not just a team, but the Team Jesus is really a team of teams. Right? It's a team of teams. Now, now I will say this, okay? There are different types of leaders and different types of gifts, and each one is important. Each one is to be um, appreciated and celebrated. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look real here, real quickly here at the different leaders that are mentioned here. Um, first, we see uh, apostles. Okay, so apostles, um, and and the the uh, apostles is interesting because. Uh, there's a difference between the office of apostle and the gifting of apostle. Right? You have to understand those distinctions. Um, in the early church, there was an official office called apostle. And in order to be an apostle, you had to be an eyewitness to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And there was a hand, uh, kind of a small hand-selected group that were apostles. But after everyone who lived in that time, who was a personal eyewitness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, passed away, that office died with it because that was the criteria to be an apostle. But the gifting, that apostolic gifting didn't die, it continued. And so when Paul is saying apostles, he's talking about leaders who have an apostolic gifting He's not talking about the office. And in, in an apostolic gifting, that, that, that word apostle, it, it means sent ones or sent. And so leaders with an apostolic gifting, these tend to be visionary type leaders who are about starting new things. They're, they're visionary leaders who like to uh, help new leaders be raised up and start new works and see new churches planted and new movements happen. That's what they're about. They're thinking big vision, movement forward. That's how apostolic leaders are wired and gifted. We also see next though, he says uh, the prophets. Uh, in, in a similar way, there's a difference between the office of prophet and the, the kind of prophetic gifting. In the Old Testament, there was this kind of small, kind of hand-selected group uh, that God chose of actual official prophets. So that would be the office of prophet. And these were people who were sent by God as representatives of God to speak on God's behalf to the people. And if you look throughout like the, the storyline of, of Israel, you'll see at different times God raised up different prophets to address whatever was going on in that particular generation or with that, in that particular uh, time. And, and, the, and the prophets would speak to the people and try to help the people to lead them towards God. That was the office of a prophet. Um, but what happened is with Jesus coming to earth and giving the spirit, the spirit now is that prophetic voice from God speaking to us through the word of God. And so there isn't a need for an office of prophet, but there can be prophetic gifting. And leaders who have a prophetic gifting, they have the ability to discern the will of God. They can hear from God and they can discern things and they can share those things with others. And this can happen in a number of different ways. It could be uh, speaking a word of encouragement, uh, a word of instruction, a word of uh, rebuke if needed. Um, it could even be sometimes saying, you know what, I think God is telling me that this is what's about to happen and we need to be prepared for this. And so it can play out in a bunch of different ways. But Really, the, the, the heart of the prophetic gifting is about hearing from God, discerning the will of God that's in alignment with the word of God and instructing others, sharing that with others so that they can be close to God, right? That's what, really what that, that is about. We, we keep looking, though. We see next uh, evangelists. 
right? We see evangelists, uh, leaders who have this gift of evangelism, they are able to take the uh, unchanging, unchanging truth of Jesus and bring it into a changing world, right? They, they understand context and cultural context to be able to say, you know what, the truth of, of the gospel never changes, but we need to share the gospel in different ways at different times with different people so that they can get it, so they can understand it. And so evangelists have that ability. They have the ability to share the gospel in ways that connect with a particular people in a particular place or a particular culture. Um, and, and they're able to be very much kind of these spearheads of movements of the gospel in communicating the gospel so people can come to faith in Christ. Uh, we also, though, see next, it says uh, shepherds. And so leaders with the shepherding gift, right? The shepherds are, are really about loving and caring for people. And so leaders who have a shepherding gift, they uh, are they're able to really do, they're great with relationships, knowing people, nurturing people, nurturing relationships, caring for people, uh, protecting people, giving them what they need so that they can flourish. And they bring a lot of relational, uh, you know, connectivity and also very much a spirit of care and love within the community, right? That's what, that's what shepherds, uh, what shepherds do. We also see here, he says, uh, teachers. And so, Leaders with the teaching gift, this is about being able to uh, take the word of God and, and, sh- and, and share it in a way to where others can understand it. So there is an, a, a learning of the word that happens that, uh, where people can apply the word in their lives. Um, and, and so it, this, they help, pe- they help the, the community really be able to live according to what God says through scripture. Right, so uh, I want you to, to think about these different, these different gifts, right? We see all these different gifts and we see here God establishing this team of a very gifted team, a diverse team. And what are these leaders to do? Well, the next thing we see is that they're to equip the saints, right? That's what they do. So there's this gift of leadership, a variety of gifts among the leadership team. And the leadership team is then to equip, the word equip is very important because this word, it means to ins- not just instruct with knowledge, but it's more than that. It's helping people develop skills. Okay, it's skill. It's, sk- it's knowledge that actually fuels ability so that skills can make things take place. So now what we see is that God has given a leadership team with a variety of gifts and those gifts are to be deployed in a way to where they're equipping the saints in all these different ways. Now, think about how this would play out. I'm gonna gonna kind of like let, let make this really clear. So think about this. Apostles, what do they do? They equip the saints for new works. That's what they do. Prophets, they equip the saints to discern the will of God. Evangelists, equip the saints to share the gospel. Shepherds, equip the saints to be able to to, to care for and love uh, each other. And then teachers, equip the saints to study and and apply the word of God in their lives. Right, So, so when you look at this and you see this list, is it a gift that God would give a church a, a leadership team with these variety of gifts that they could equip the body in these, these vari- this variety of ways? Isn't that a gift? I think we can look at this and go, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Like totally, like we need to be like taking new ground so that the mission go, can go forward. Oh, thanks apostles, right? We need to be able to actually be in alignment with what God wants and discern what he wants and follow what he wants. Thanks prophets. Uh, we we wanna be able to share the gospel so that people can learn about Jesus and uh, come to faith in him. Thanks evangelists. And you know what? We need to be a loving community so that we're actually sharing the, the, the heart of God with each other. Uh, thanks shepherds. And by the way, we wanna do this all according to God's word so that we can be living out what he wants for us. Thanks, teachers. And so you see here a lot of intentionality in the way that Jesus has established Team Jesus with a team of teams, uh, a leadership team to equip the, to equip the saints in a variety of different ways. And so I want you to see this very clearly. That's why I'm trying to, 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 to like belabor it so much, because I want you to understand 
that, that the, the, the nuances of the way the team, our team is supposed to work, the way that we're supposed to operate. And I want you to be able to, uh, to really appreciate this dynamic within the community. Now, I, I do want to take a moment just, just, just briefly and say, um, if you are a leader, there is a, there is a, a takeaway for you that I think you need to hear, right? It, uh, so leaders... Do you ever feel like you're a little overwhelmed and you have too much to do? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you ever feel like, you know, the, the weight of leadership, this responsibility you have on your shoulders, it makes you feel like you've got to just do everything yourself? Yeah. No. That's actually not what God wants. I think sometimes what happens is leaders... Leaders will place responsibility on themselves and they'll feel like I've got to do it all myself. And God says, actually, that's not the way I've designed it. I've designed it to be a team so that there's a, a different people helping and complimenting each other and working together and there's a shared load. And so when you understand that, what it does is it frees you from kind of this, I think, a self-imposed burden that leaders often put on themselves. It frees you from that. And also what it does is it helps you understand that if you're a point leader of, of something, right, a team, a ministry, you know, a business, an organization, whatever it is, if you're the point leader, your job is not to do everything. Rather, your job is to try to build a really healthy leadership team where there can be complementary gifts. And then the organization or the rest of the team or the people or whoever it is will be led well. And personally, I find that to be super encouraging because it means that not any one of us are supposed to do everything, but we get to operate together. And when we operate together, we're better together, right? We're better together because we complement each other, we help each other, and life is just more enjoyable with each other. So we see here, these, these uh, leaders being called to equip the saints. And what do they do as they're equipping the saints? What are they equipping the saints for? We see here for the work of ministry, right? That's what the equipping is happening for. So, so, it's, so, so let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit. Who are they equipping? The saints. Who are the saints? Uh, it's, you know, it's not, it's not like a, uh, you know, a baseball team or, uh, or a, ba uh, you know, a football team or something like that, right? The saints is the people of God. That's the saints. And the saints are not like these people who lived long time ago and did these amazing things. And, you know, you had to accomplish like this and that and the other thing and a miracle had to happen. And then someone, you know, in a robe said, boo, you're a saint. Uh, that is not the way it actually works. The way it works in, in according to God's word is that Jesus does a work to give all of his people his righteousness. So we are in Christ. We are made righteous in Christ, which means every single believer is a saint in Christ. You are a righteous saint. You are a saint. You're like, my mom didn't call me a saint when I was a little kid. Well, you, if you're in Christ, you're a saint, right? That's you. So, so leaders equip the saints. Why? What are we equipped towards, right? Are, 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 we're equipped towards work, right? The work of ministry. This is very, very, very important. It's so important that you get this, right? You are a saint, which means you are called by God to do ministry. You have a ministry. You've been called to ministry. You're a saint. Now think about this for a moment. As a saint, you are a missionary, which means you have, you're just a person who's on mission, right? That's missionary. You have a ministry. Your ministry is everywhere you are. The places where you live, work, learn, play, all the places that you are, that's your mission field. That's it. And your ministry is 24 seven. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not that you're like, well, I, I'm the church. And so, you know, like sometimes people, what people think is they'll think, well, you know, I'm a Christian, so I go to church to be served and the church is a building and that's what it is. Like, no, no, it's actually not biblical. We don't go to church, we are the church. And though we do serve each other, we are the church who don't go to a place to be served, but rather we come together to experience unique and wonderful, passionate uh, movements of God. And we're sent out as the church on mission with every single one of us having a, a ministry and a mission field. And so you are a 24 seven missionary. Ministry is a lifestyle, right? It's not an event. And so, so what we see here is that there is a work that God has given us to do. There's a work that God has given you to do. You have a ministry. You have a ministry. And this is incredibly important to understand. And unfortunately, there are not very many people that get this, right? Uh, sadly, what happens is sometimes there's this kind of like misconception in, in, the, in the church. And it goes like this. Um, well, ministry is very formal and it's very official. And the pastor's they do ministry. And the rest of us, well, we get ministered to. That's actually not biblical. Now, do pastors do ministry and do they minister to, to the saints? Of course, sure. But the reason why I say it's not biblical is because it's only a part of the, of, the, of the picture. It's only a part of the story. It's not the whole story, right? There's a lot more to the story than that. And, and what do we see is that, you know, the leaders, right? The, the leaders, different types of gifting, equip the saints to do ministry. So it's the leader's job to equip, equip the saints. That's how the leaders minister to the saints. It's through the equipping ministry. It's the saints' job to actually do the ministry, according to their gifting and their passions, they do ministry in a variety of different ways. So this idea that ministry is something very official and formal, and it's only done by like professional clergy is not a biblical idea because God said, no, 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 no. You're a kingdom of priests. You're all ministers of the gospel. You've all been given the spirit of God. You all have spiritual gifts. You're all called and you're all sent. And I want a kingdom of priesthood, a kingdom of priests all over every place on earth, ministering, ministering in the name of God, ministering with the heart of God. That's what God has called us to. That's what God wants. That's what's in his word. And that's so radically different than sometimes these ideas that people get in their head in the kind of American Christian bubble. And what I'm hoping to do today is to give you a vision beyond that so that we can live beyond that. If you just look at like certain things that are happening in the American Christian church, like according to research, like statistically, 45% of people who are in the church, believers, serve in, 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 or in some way. Statistically, 28% of people who are in the church who claim to be believers have never served in any way, shape, or form, not even once. So it, 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 what that means when you look at those stats is you're like, well, if only half of the church is doing the work of ministry, that means that the other half of the church is actually missing out. They're not experiencing the beauty of doing the work of ministry. And the rest of the church is also missing out because they're not experiencing the beauty of those people with their gifts doing ministry. Right? And if 28% is like sitting on the, the sidelines, they're like on the bench, they don't even think they have a jersey on, right? Maybe they're not even on the bench. Maybe they're in the stands and they're like, I'm not even on the team. It's like, you're on the team. You have a jersey. You actually, in fact, you're not even sitting on the bench. You're supposed to be on the field right now. The play is happening and you're missing. What's, what's, up, what's up, right? And so when we get this, we start to realize like, God has called us to something and empowered us to something so much beyond what we are probably comfortable with. 
And, 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 and I, as this was clicking for me, okay, this, like, this, this passage we're looking at today is one of my favorites, and I've gone to it over and over and over and over and over again over the years. I go to it all the time. I love it, right? And this week, I went to it again, and I was like, yeah, I know all these things. Like, I could pretty much quote this to you, but I'm going to get into it again. And I was getting into it, and as I was getting into it, I felt like a, like a mad scientist in his laboratory, And I was starting to see these connections and I was like, oh, this is, oh, oh, oh yeah. The way that the leadership goes and the ministry and all the, how it all plays out. And just think about all the various implications and how this could play out in all these different ways. And I was like, oh. And so I was texting the team, like, can we put together this slide? And I'm like sending them pictures of slides I was finding. Can we, there's gotta be a way to show this in some kind of like visual so people can see like all the different connections. And they're like, you're crazy. (laughs) <laughs> no, that's not what they said. Actually, they're like, they're like, we don't think we can create something that, like this. It's just too complicated. And I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, so instead of giving you an amazing visual that I wish I could, I'm going to give you a boring sentence as a description. <laughs> but maybe you'll be able to see this because I was like, Eureka, I'm seeing this on all, this is amazing. And maybe you'll be able to look at this and go, oh, I get the kind of Eureka moment. Maybe you can have your own moment for a moment. So here's here's what I wanna show you, okay? This is God's biblical model for ministry. This is his model. Different leaders with different spiritual gifts equip different Christians with different spiritual gifts to do all kinds of different types of ministry. I'm crazy, right? (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Right, but I'm gonna read it again, but I want you to try to think of it. Okay, different leaders, team of leaders with different spiritual gifts. Oh, a- a- apostles and prophets and you know, evangelists and teachers and you know, shepherds, okay? Equip different Christians. Now we're talking about like every different part of the body, all the different parts of the body with different types of spiritual gifts. Think back the last couple of weeks, we were looking at all these different spiritual gifts. We were looking at like, you know, like list of like, last week you looked at like eight different gifts. The week before that, I think it was like five or six different gifts. So there's like, you know, dozens of spiritual gifts that are uh, given and deployed to do all kinds of different types of ministry. So it's not one size fits all, but rather this beautiful, like interconnected web of gifted people with all kinds of passions doing all kinds of amazing things. You see how I was starting to like go, because if you think about that, if you think about leadership equipping a multitude of Christians who are all supernaturally empowered by the spirit, supernaturally and gifted. If you think about that like a, like a net, okay? If you use, maybe use that kind of illustration, there's a net, but it's really big and it's gonna be cast all over the world. And this net has been given all the gifts necessary to impact the world. Now you start to see like, oh my goodness, God was doing some crazy stuff. Like he was setting up the church to minister to the world from generation to generation throughout the ages. And that's exactly what has happened and is happening. Now, what takes place, right? What takes place when we get this and we actually say, yes, yes, I'm a saint and I'm gonna do the work of ministry. Here's what happens. If you look in verse 12, it says, for the building up of the body. So when we actually embrace our ministries of all the various kinds that they are, there is a byproduct. The body is built up. And the body is built up in a variety of different ways. In fact, he's going to go on to tell us four different ways that the body is built up. We're going to look at each of them um, The first is unity, right? Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. If leaders are not equipping the saints and there's disunity, people don't know, they don't know about the faith and there's like, oh, the people have different ideas about faith. They're, They're not quite sure like exactly who is Jesus and what is he about? What's his mission? There's all this disunity in the church, but when the leaders are equipping the saints and the saints are doing ministry, inevitably the spirit is moving through the church to where there's unity. Unity of who Jesus is, unity of what our faith is about, unity around the mission of God. That's one of the ways that the body is built up. 
also, though, we see next is maturity, right? The other part of verse 13, it says, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so when leaders are not equipping and the saints are not doing their, their, their work, there's immaturity happening in the body, right? And it's not just the individuals are immature, but collectively the, the church is immature. And, and, and with that immaturity comes faithlessness and all kinds of manner of sin and things happening that ought not happen that are destructive and damaging to us. But when there's equipping that's happening and saints doing ministry, then what ends up happening is there's maturity. The individual starts to grow as they're ministering. They start growing and maturing, but then everyone else is growing and maturing because everyone is using their gifts to minister to each other to help everyone grow and mature. What else do we see? The third thing we see is doctrinal purity. Verse 14, he says, so that we may not be tossed, uh, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. When the leaders are not equipping and the saints are not doing the work of ministry, then there is, uh, there's like, you know, heresy that happens and there's lies that are believed. So sometimes what takes place is that if people, people don't know the Bible, they don't know what God says, they start believing all kinds of crazy stuff. It's like, he uses here this, this, this language of toss to and fro by the, the waves. It's like the idea of, the, of like a boat that doesn't have a rudder and the wind of culture is blowing this way and that way and the Christians are just like, oh, and they're just being tossed all over the place because they're not like, focused and they don't have like a rudder, that rudder being like leadership and ministry that keeps them moving, you know, in the way that God wants them to move. Why are there, why are there so many different Christians that they watch one little video online and they're like, oh, like completely shatters their faith. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of it is they weren't equipped and they weren't using their gifts and they weren't in a community of equipping uh, equipping and a, a community where people were actually using their gifts together. And so there, there's that, that it, it ends up, you know, messing their lives get turned over is what happens. And that can happen to us collectively. If we're, we're not actually using our gifts collectively. Uh, also though, we see uh, another way that we grow is in love. Uh, he says here, uh, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, so, so when there isn't equipping and people aren't doing the work of ministry, there's a lack of love that happens. And the opposite is also true. When there is equipping and people are doing ministry, then we're receiving the love of God, we're sharing the love of God, and that's happening in very practical ways. But if you read here, he's like uh, speaking the truth in love. So now people start speaking the truth to each other, but they're doing it, even if it's a, a challenging word or a hard word, it's a word that's given in love. He goes on, he says, oh, and then we start to grow up in every way into him who is the head. So now because of this loving environment that's happening within the culture of the church, everybody's growing in all these different ways. He says, uh, you know, from whom the whole body joined and held together with every joint, uh, which it is equipped when each part, this is the part, when each part is working properly. So everyone is embracing their gifts. They're ministering to each other, right? When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What does this mean? Very simply, that if we don't embrace our gifts, if we don't do ministry out of our giftedness, we won't grow in the ways that God wants us to grow. We won't grow in unity. We won't grow in maturity. We won't grow in doctrinal purity and we won't grow in love. However, the opposite is also true. If the leaders are embracing their gifts and using them by equipping the saints and if the saints are embracing their gifts and using them by doing ministry to one another, then what happens? We all start to grow and we grow in unity and maturity and doctrinal purity and in love. And so there is a direct correlation between our, 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 our using of gifts and doing ministry and our growing and maturing, right? This idea, like, 
There's this theological idea called sanctification, which just simply means to grow and mature. And a lot of times people think that, oh, well, sanctification, you're like I'm learning and it's about head knowledge. I'm just learning things. And the more I learn, the more I grow. That's a part of it, but it's only one part of it. Because what we see here is that a part of sanctification is embracing our gifts, using our gifts, doing the work of ministry, and then we grow together as we do that together. And the body will not grow as it ought unless that happens. But when that happens, each part is operating properly, then the body grows in this beautiful way that God intends it to. Here's the heart of the matter, friends. The more we work, the more we grow, right? And I know that like this, sometimes this idea of work's like, oh, work, and like it has all kinds of like negative connotation. Put it in the context of Ephesians 4. The more we embrace our gifts and then minister out of our giftedness, work, right? The more we do that, the more we grow individually and corporately. You will not grow and mature as God wants you to, to the degree that he wants you to, unless you are embracing your gifts and doing the work of ministry. Conversely, if you do, and when you do embrace your gifts and do the work of ministry, you will just you will start to mature and grow in ways that you could never imagine. And, and you'll keep growing and maturing in ways that you cannot imagine because it's just an ongoing. We just keep growing to become more and more and more and more and more like Jesus until one day when you, you, know, you die, your eyes close, and then they open up and you're looking at Jesus face to face, right? I don't know exactly how all that works, but until you see him face to face, we just want to keep growing to be like him. That's kind of the plan. Now, in, in, in saying this, I want to call you to something as we, we're going to kind of wrap up our time, I'm going to, but I'm going to call you to something because I want you to not just hear me give a lot of instruction. You have to understand the biblical model for ministry so that you can, you can get it. Deep heart conviction. But now it's like, well, what do I do? How do I, how do I live this out? I'm going to tell you how, how you live it out. We are, uh, we are officially launching today uh, this idea that we're, we're calling meetups, okay? And this is something that other churches do uh, that we learn this from partnerships with other churches. And the idea is really simple, right? We want to empower you to be able to use your gifts to be able to do the work of ministry. So this is an empowering mechanism. We are literally saying You get to dream up whatever you want to use your gifts in any way you want to do ministry in all the various ways that it could play out. And what what that'll mean is there will be all of these different people with different gifts doing all these different things around our city and even beyond. And it'll be like like a web or a net of ministry that is happening. So, you, so if you're like, I, I need some structure, I need, some, I need something like a platform to, to work off of, this is it, okay? If you go to our church website under the event page, you'll see something called meetups. It was put on the website today. It just went live like a, a couple of hours ago. And there is a, it'll take you step by step through all of it. What are meetups? How to do a meetup? How to create your own meetup? And, and what that will look like. And then you will be able to fulfill the ministry that God has put on your heart. And not only that, here's where it gets really, really cool. As you think about these meetups, you might start to go, you know, I should probably partner with someone with these gifts because then we could work together in this meetup. And now you're starting to partner together with these teams of a variety of gifts working together on a particular initiative. Right, a meetup could be something like, hey, we're going to go and we're going to serve at, you know, a care net or a homeless shelter or whatever. And you say, we're going to get a group of people together and we're going to go and do that. That could be a meetup. A meetup could be, hey, you know what? We're a bunch of artists and we're going to get together and we're going to paint. A meetup could be like, we are all like complete and total like, you know, uh, like gaming nerds and we're just going to get together and play games. It could be that. Right? It could be anything, uh, so long as it's not sin, right? 
Uh, that's the one thing it can't be. Uh, but, but a meetup could be anything. Like you get to be creative, you get to dream, you get to imagine, and then you can go and be the church on mission with God. That's the idea. So, so if you've ever, you know, sometimes it'll be like, well, I wanted to, people will say this. I've heard people say this to me. They're like, well, I wanted to do something and I had this like real passion for it, but I just didn't ever do it. Well, why didn't you do it? Well, I didn't think I could do it. Why did you think that? I don't know. I just didn't think I could do it. It's like I, I needed someone to give me permission, right? Okay, hear this. You can do it. You have permission. And it's not even me giving you permission because God has given you a spiritual gift. God has given you a ministry. God has called you. And if you need a little bit of encouragement to say, so go, then hear this as that, go, right? Go and do ministry, be encouraged. And here's what I wanna close us with. A movement starts with one person. Think of the movement of Christianity. It started with one person, Jesus himself, who lived and died and rose, who then sent out the church. And then it started with just a small group of people and they're operating in their giftedness. And then as they do, more people hear about Christ and come to faith. And then the church grows a little bit bigger. And then those people are using their giftedness and more people hear about Christ and come to faith. And then the church grows a little bit bigger and so on and so forth from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Right? That's the way the movement of Christianity began. And that's the way the, the movement of Christianity has continued from generation to generation. And that is the way the movement of Christianity happens right now. And you are a part of it. And you're invited and called to create momentum and movement within the places where you live, work, learn, and play. Let's pray together. God, we uh, thank you for giving us gifts and we thank you for establishing this way in which the church ought to function as a team. And uh, God, I do pray and I ask, help us to see clearly like what this looks practically so that each person who's hearing this message would be able to discern his or her own gifts and then uh, be able to dream within their passions and to then launch out doing ministry in a variety of different ways, Lord. Uh, we do pray, God, may there be uh, godly leadership uh, not only in our church, but beyond our church, throughout our community. Uh, may there be teams and ministries and businesses and organizations just filled with godly leaders. May those godly leaders be equipping and equipping and equipping so that the saints can be doing all kinds of wonderful ministry. And God, may there be this movement of equipped saints embracing their gifts and doing ministry. And so I'm asking and praying even now, Lord, as, as we're concluding our time and wrapping it up, would you start to lay on different people's hearts the different ways in which they can do ministry? And Lord, we do pray for growth we want to grow in unity. We want to grow in maturity. We want to grow in doctrinal purity. We want to grow in love. And so help us to minister to each other so that we can grow. And as we grow, God, may this movement of Jesus expand and may more and more people join Team Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, friends, as we receive...